In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With me, Tim and Natalie Blackham. Thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Hi, welcome to the In the Last Days te television program from Jerusalem. And I'm Martin Blackham. Natalie's behind the scenes today and says hello to you. And in the studio today, we're very excited to welcome Walter Bingham, veteran journalist and currently uh, based in uh, Jerusalem, uh, working with Arut Sheva. And uh, what's so exciting, and you're going to want to tell people not to miss these programs, is that you were an eyewitness to what happened uh, uh, pre-World War II. And um, you were saying, uh, uh, Walter, about the Versailles Peace Treaty was really where uh, this all, all started, the, the, the rise of Nazism and um, what you saw happening in Germany. Well, that's I I indeed when it all started, because the Versailles Treaty was, uh, was wrong, which was realized uh, after the Second World War when the uh, uh, Allies uh, helped the defeated Germans to set up a proper democracy uh, rather than uh, what happened uh, after the Versailles Treaty where they dismantled the industry and took everything, the, uh, brought uh, all the machinery back and therefore created unemployment. There was uh, all the in industry was dismantled and uh, you had the uh, many, many unemployed in addition to the disheveled German army that came back at that time and uh, were depressed, of course, having lost the war. And uh, so there was a whole mass of people who were, didn't know what to do. And then there were elected, that was uh, after the Versailles Treaty, and of course uh, uh, then there was the, the uh, Weimar Republic. And uh, when people were dissatisfied, so 34 parties, uh, I think, they were there, and those, those parties all v v um, vied for power. And they all had different isms. You had the liberals, liberalism, and you had communi communism and, uh, and, and centralism and all kinds of isms, and people were not interested in those philosophical explanations of, of, of parties. People wanted uh, to, uh, to get back to normal. So Hitler came along and he said, look, he, d he didn't give them any isms. He said, look, vote for me and I'll give you work and bread. And work and bread is what the, that's exactly what the people wanted to hear. And that is, is how he, he got them. And that was uh, in, the, in the early years, uh, in the early, early 30s. And then, of course, uh, came the elections and eventually he came to power. Now, you, you uh, lived in Germany uh, during this huge, huge change in history after the First World War and you saw... So what were your memories of... Um well, I, I was born in, in Germany, of course, and uh, I had uh, three years of school. I, I remember some school years. And I had three years of school that were before Hitler came to power. And so it, uh, life was quite normal, you know. Uh, we were in the schoolyard and uh, played ball and kicked the ball around, and I had my share of the ball. And then uh, after the elections in 1933, Hitler came to power, and slowly things changed. I, I'm not sure if teachers were had briefings of how to deal with Jews. Of course, there were only one or two Jews in each class. You know, in the city I lived in at that time had 156,000 inhabitants. Today, I think it's 250,000. But uh, there were not all that many Jews, and we were. Uh, scattered all over the school system. And, and then suddenly, as I said, things changed. And of course, um, children had to go to Hitler Youth, particularly if they were uh, the children of state employees, for instance, or even others. 
and in the evening after school they had to go and they were indoctrinated there of course and uh, in, and that indoctrination was quite heavy so was the the hitler youth was something like a uh, cub scouts or uh, well it was uh, it was more than that it, because in in scouts you learn the nice things how to uh, survive in 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 the wood and how to make a, a fire and cook your, uh, uh, your 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 meal but the hitler youth was organized like a military organization because you know hitler had already plans to ex to expand to the east and so he needed soldiers and he knew that it would take some time and these children would grow up and would become soldiers so he organized it all in a military fashion uh, if you look at the picture you can see you can see how the rank structure uh, looked it was from the lowest to the this highest this is a hitler youth this is a hitler youth uh, uniform mm -hmm. and uh, and these are the epaulets and you can see that it's rather like in an army and so that's what they did in uh, after school they had to go and uh, they were as i said indoctrinated and then they marched up and down up and down did you see them i saw them uh, marching and and the terrible thing is that uh, th that was I, I i'm jumping ahead a little but the, uh, the terrible thing is that they were the children who were at school with me and uh, and then they shunned me i was no longer one of them of course all these uniforms that uh, uh, that they wore all uniforms had some kind of a dagger you know they, uh, mm -hmm. it was part of the uniform the hitler youth also had a dagger and the, the that's a, an interesting one uh, you see you see it here it has a, uh, a swastika on it and uh, and 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 one of those uh, what i don't know what they call this so you can really dig deep <laughs> and when you take it off and you look at the blade you see it says blood and honor yeah, in german in yes. german mm -hmm. blut und ehre mm -hmm. and what does it mean blood and honor so uh, you can have your own views about that uh, i believe and i I tell you the evidence for it is that the more blood you make with this the more honor you have because the Hitler youth when they were marching and exercising and doing their thing were also singing songs one of the songs went well I said usually I could sing it for you in German but I'm not going to impose that on you but to, to translate it it said when Jewish blood spurts from the knife the word spritzt is the German word. You know, you can feel it, spritzt, it spurts. Spurts from the knife, then everything will go much better. And they sang this song? They sang this song, and I had to listen to that. So you well, can see... So you, so you listen to that in the schoolyard? Uh, or? No, uh, in the street. And oh. then we, lear we, lear we learned right. all those songs. We learned all those songs as, uh, uh, as well. And, uh, and you can hear it, and you hear it on the radio, and you hear it everywhere. So they were being indoctrinated and very very heavily so i became uh, uh, the outcast uh, at school and uh, eventually it got worse and worse so so your friends were going to to hitler youth so when they came back to school they would be talking about you know the uh, what they'd been up to and you would feel suddenly there was a you know, a new agenda that you weren't uh, part of, really. Well, they were no longer my friends. <laughs> they, they, they really d treated me very badly. And of course, uh, I, I go to the teacher and excuse me, and I say to the teacher, uh, uh, teacher, look what Johnny did to me. Uh, uh, and the teacher wouldn't do anything. So it meant that it's okay to treat the Jew like that. And of course, then there were. Uh, it was nasty language, dirty, stinking, filthy Jew, and things. From like the that children. Time. From the children. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And uh, so, did that cause truancy amongst the Jewish children? No, right. no. We 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 went, and eventually, I must tell you, eventually they decided. Of course, you know, you we were sitting on these school desks two by two, and the the pens. Like today, really. A bit. Yeah, and the pens we had, mm -hmm. uh, they were uh, little pen ho nib holders with little nibs, and you dip them into the mm -hmm. uh, into the ink okay right. but but uh, the um, a german i call him a german boy as, uh, as opposed to jew and the aryan boy as they call him sitting next to me uh, was doing what children usually do you know he'd look across see what uh, what i wrote and he'd copy me 
and uh, he would get good marks and I would get bad marks. Well, you couldn't, they couldn't take a chance that the Jew would know anything better than the German because we were inf already uh, uh, in inferior. So he, uh, uh, so that's how we were treated. And, and how did the parents feel, you know, the Jewish parents in Germany? Because when you went home, you'd say, well, you know, mum, dad, I've been at school today and I've tried to. And I, you know, I, I haven't given that much thought. I haven't really, it's a very good question uh, that I had never really considered. Uh, I suppose, well, I don't know. I, I, I I, I, don't, I don't remember. Maybe there were so much other things there going so on many, that, there that they couldn't... So many things. Of course, you see that uh, my father, who was uh, a, a, a printer, he worked in the, in the newspaper as a compositor. He had eyes like a hawk. And, and you know, they had the old... The, the, they don't print to, like today on computers. They had to take the letters and put it all together. And that was his job. And then he was thrown out from his his job. So they had their own uh, problems and uh, we had a, not an easy life. I want to tell you more about my school. They decided that they couldn't expect that German boy sitting next to a Jew. So they sent me to the back of the class. Well, so so you physically, they, they physically, physically moved they moved me to the back of the class by myself. So you can imagine what that shows. That shows that I am different. I, I don't belong anymore. And so children could do all sorts of things I mean, uh, in, in the schoolyard. I mean, they would chase me about and uh, uh, we had a fairly tough time at school. And all around, of course, were the political developments in, in uh, let me just be, you know, at my age, I, you get forgetful. Uh, I can oh, tell okay. you, I can tell you what happened many, many years ago, as I do, but uh, the, the, the sequence in the short-term memory isn't, uh, isn't uh, so good. I wanted to, uh, to say that, to go back, if I can, to the beginning where these, uh, these disheveled soldiers came back and, and, uh, and uh, Hitler knew not only to offer them work and bread, but he knew that Germans love uniforms. I must tell you that. I uh, should have mentioned that earlier. They love uniforms. The more garbage you have on the more uh, things you have on your uniform, the better it is. So he gave these guys, put them all into uniforms. These were the brown shirts, the initially brown shirts, SA, Sturmabteilung. They, they were the, the, the guys who did the dirty work. So all of a sudden, they had uniforms, they had jack boots from being unemployed uh, 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 guys standing on the street corners and he said they felt, they felt tall and they felt something and so they were, they were doing the, the bidding for the, for, the, for the Nazis and then of course came the, uh, the boycotts and when they went outside Jewish shops and uh, painted um, Magen David, uh, Star of David, on the windows and stood outside and, and put And did you see that? Um, I saw all that. that. Yeah, my uncle had a shop in the main road of the town and I, I saw that. And they prevented people from going into the shops. Would they physically block the door entrance? Well, they would, st you can't, f they didn't physically uh, restrain them, but they would uh, make it very uncomfortable. But then there were people in, and not only my uncle's shop, he had a clothes shop, but other Jewish shops, like grocery shops. And you, you would get women who would want to go in and say, look, get out of my way. I, my, my grandfather used to go in that shop, my father, my, or my, my mother, and my parents, and, uh, and we like the man behind the counter, and we like his goods, and we like his price, and we like what, what he does. I'm going in. And they went in. On the way out, they were stopped and had to give their name and address. The next morning in the newspaper, these people still buy from Jews. So you can imagine what that did. That was the first sort of, um, the beginning of, of, of uh, economic strangulations for, for the shops. And all the neighbors would, would whisper, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, 
Jones and Mrs. Smith and uh, goes into that shop. And uh, then they were a, a little bit in trouble and also warned because if they had a job somewhere, then th that job was in jeopardy. And they never went in any anymore, of course. And so the <laughs> business uh, dropped. And uh, did the rabbi say anything at this time or was it too many things happening at the same no, time? No, the rabbis, uh, the, we all, we didn't need the rabbis to tell us anything. We, we, uh, we knew, we felt, you felt it and you knew and you uh, didn't, didn't want to believe it. I mean, there were, there were the, what we call a German Jew who was t two, three generations uh, ago that maybe his people came or maybe longer from, uh, from the East. And then there was the Eastern European Jew who came after the pogroms in Russia and in Poland uh, at the turn of the, uh, at the turn or just before the century. And uh, the, uh, the turn of the 19th and 20th century, of course. Uh, and, uh, and the German Jew who was very integrated and very assimilated and more German than the Germans, uh, who fought in the, f in the First World War and got decorations, Iron Cross and all that uh, stuff. They said, well, nothing can happen to me. I, I fought for the fatherland. I, um, I have the Iron Cross. And they were very, dis uh, very uh, uh, disillusioned because uh, Hitler made no difference between them and any any other Jew, so they had a, they had a very different. So it was in a, in a way they couldn't believe that um, um, that Hitler would do anything. That to it was them. maybe empty threats right. or. When he came to power, of course, he 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 came to power by democratic means, by a normal vote, and he had. Uh, Which uh, is very pertinent at the moment. Yes, isn't it? yes, <laughs> my, a minority vote. He came to power by oh, the minority, minority vote. Uh, he, he had the most votes, but he didn't have a majority in, in uh, of the votes. But that brought him to power. So the first thing he did, he tried to dismantle this uh, democratic scheme, and uh, they burned down the parliament building, and uh, uh, put the blame on a feeble-minded Dutchman called Van der Lubbe. Van der Lubbe was a communist and uh, they found him somewhere near there and put the blame on him. So he had uh, exactly what he needed. He burned down the parliament and, uh, and dismantled that system, although there was a, a, a temporary one erected, but they were just uh, rubber stampers. But Van der Lubbe as a communist, that was the big thing for him. As you see, the communists because he wanted to expand to the East and he wa communism was his main enemy. So he did two things with, uh, at once, dismantling democracy and, and, and say, see, it's the fault of the, of the communists. So that, that, was, uh, that was one thing. And then um, there was also... So, uh, you, so at, this at this stage of um, when you lived in Germany, how, how did you get the news? Was that from the newspapers or the radio? Well, at that stage, uh, it, uh, uh, you, read the news, you read the newspapers. But, but you, you're bringing me a little bit uh, uh, too far forward, but I will tell you that the Germans, like the, like the Volkswagen, which people build, the VW today that everybody drives, uh, that was originally made as a Volkswagen, a people's car, and every German should have one of those. But when they built them, of course, they went into the military and the civilians didn't get them. Just as they built this Volkswagen, so they built what they called Volksempfänger, a uh, Volksradio. So because they wanted everybody to be able to hear the speeches of, the, of Hitler and the Nazis. And that radio would just pick up the station around the corner. Your local, you couldn't pick up anything else on it. But some of us uh, still had old radios. Uh, the older people will remember the ones where, the, where there were names of stations and you could choose them. We had one of those. So my parents wanted to hear what the news was, especially in the later years. And so how did one do that? You switch off the lights, you close the curtains, and you take the duvet off the bed, and you put the duvet over the top of the radio on yourself, and then you would move the scale of the radio to 
we would move it to Strasbourg in France because that was very close by where I lived. Uh, I, I, I should just tell you maybe where I lived. And they spoke um, some German, didn't they? And, and this was a German. Th mm -hmm. uh, this was a German station uh, uh, news in German, and they listened to it and got to know from France at that time at that uh, stage what was uh, what was happening uh, throughout the period. And then you'd take the duvet off. You'd first you'd you'd scale you'd move your scale back to the German station just in case. And uh, then you uh, put your duvet away. That's how they. Uh, so there was it's the there was a, an atmosphere of fear really to. Well, yeah, it was prohibited to listen to any foreign stations. That was prohibited absolutely. You 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 weren't allowed to do to do that. And that's how they how they got uh, how they got the news. And then um, oh, uh, there was also a restriction of civil civil certain civil liberties. Uh, for everybody, and it, we didn't have the United Nations. We had the forerunner of the United Nations, the League, League of, of Nations. Nations at that mm -hmm. time. Yes, and the League of Nations, I think, made some noises at uh, at, at Hitler about his uh, uh, about his activities. And so what he said is, "We don't need you," and he just left the League of Nations. So Germany got out. Of, it's as if we today would leave the United Nations. And uh, he just left, and he said, "Look, uh, don't tell me what to do." I, I suppose he said, and uh, and he left. Did this happen whilst you were at school? That was happened in uh, in 1933 already, mm -hmm. in in October. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, at school, of course, uh, uh, the teachers do. Uh, you know, I told you before that I sat at the last bench, and you know what children want to do when the teacher asks a question. You raise your hand and you want to answer it. Well, they never, in the end, never asked me. And never called me to to answer the question because, uh, again, uh, I may have been wrong in my answer. Nevertheless, they could, wouldn't take the chance that the Jew would know something which maybe others in the class don't. So uh -huh. that was another uh, uh, another thing that happened. Uh, I <laughs> I haven't got the plate here, but uh, we changed. We had to ch after three years at school. I thought I could now write and read. Suddenly, they introduced a different type of script. Uh, you wouldn't recognize it. And this was an alphabet? It was an alphabet, yes. Right. And we had to relearn it. Um, and the whole, the, whole, uh, the whole alphabet. And that, uh, that, was, a, uh, was, a, that and was an interesting... Uh, uh, and as to... So, that, so as did the Nazis bring in a... For their own reasons, or why did they change? I have no idea because the old-fashioned German writing you see today—that was—I uh, don't know—they wanted to to do their own thing. I have no idea why they did it, but it was called Sutterlin. I think Sutterlin was the name of the man who uh, who invented that, uh, and uh, that that was that was uh, th and in indoctrination, of course, <coughs> was done because Hitler said. Give me a boy until he is 12, and I'll make him my man for life. You have uh, today a parallel with our life here and the Arab youth who are indoctrinated very young. And uh, you, you know, you've seen pictures, they dress them up as shihads as, uh, with, uh, with uh, various things and, uh, and, and teach them. Uh, there was a picture once in the paper where a man had a maybe a two, three-year-old child on his shoulder, went to a demonstration somewhere in the a Arab areas, and the child had a stone in the hand. He, ha he made sure it could hold the stone. Uh, if you have young children and you walk somewhere and there is a, a demonstration, you say to your child, come on, let's, let's get out of here, let's go the other way. Well, uh, so uh, they were indoctrinated in Germany in, in, a, in, a, in a similar way that they do it here. And did, did it become dangerous for the, for the for Jewish Jews? children? Uh, not, in the, not in the street at that point. Not in the street at that point. Of course, you wouldn't uh, walk about, like, as you wouldn't today, in Arab areas with a uh, skull cap. Mm -hmm. With a, uh, and uh, you'd have a, we would have our head covered. I'd have a, a cap of some kind, of course, always uh, uh, on my way. Not at school, not in the schoolroom. 
And the bullying went on, and the uniforms went on, and the, uh, the boycotts went on, and, uh, and eventually they decided that all anything Jewish in the way of art and literature was degenerate art. That included all books written by Jews, n uh, about Jews that, are, that were um, uh, nice, and also sculpture, music, Mendelssohn. He, mm. he, he was, uh, his music was banned. Einstein, the sculptor, that, that, that was uh, degenerate art. And they decided that people must no longer read it. So they made a whole list of prescribed literature, literature that you're not allowed to have in, in your home. And all the libraries had to, uh, had to deliver up this long, the long list of books, empty the shelves and bring it to a, a particular place. And people at home were told that if you have such books, you must also bring them. And uh, you were not allowed, that was very, very dangerous, not allowed to have them in your house. So they all brought them to a, in, in my town, to the um, park, to the castle park, which I knew well because we used to play there. And, uh, and they put them all on a big, uh, even almost like a, 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 the bonfires they have in, uh, in November in England. Uh, to to commemorate to Kai for commemorate certain events, there was a very large bonfire. All these books were burned, and the public was there with their parcels, and they throw the books on the fire. They brought their books with they them. They brought their and books they added and, it to them. and then threw it, and, and they were singing songs and and very happy. And you saw this happening. I, well, I was a little boy, but we I was a nosy little uh, boy, and and we went to the park where we always played and I actually saw it in my town and they were singing and uh, raising their hand in the Hitler salute and doing all kinds of things burning German literature uh, you see you see here's a picture I can, uh, um, where I can show the yeah. the viewers on the screen now uh, if you're like me and you've been uh, glued to this interview you're going to want to watch the the next program we have uh, uh, Walter again uh, on the In the Last Days television program. It's been great to uh, be with you. Uh, and if you'd like to contact Walter, you can get in touch with him at Walter at Israel National Radio. That's one word. Israel National Radio, Israel one word. Dot com. Dot com. Yes. So Walter at Israel National Radio dot com. Great to be with you. Thank you for watching today. And remember, we're living in the last days. You've been watching In the Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy-to-use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter Get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible.